Not all your days are going to go easy, and today was a particularly bad day for me. I felt like I was at the lowest of the low. I felt like maybe I would have harmed my patients. I didn't, but it doesn't make me feel any better to know that that possibility could have happened. I think a lot of the risks of being a nurse is that you have other people's lives on your hands, but then you also have a lot to do. So you have to be able to balance doing tasks and trying to do them accurately while still taking care of more than five or six patients. So it's, it's a lot and I don't feel very good today. So today was a pretty hard day. I had been working with my preceptor for about two and a half weeks and she had graduated me over to two patients and since it's almost the third maybe the fourth you know coming up on the fourth week um, we felt like I could handle three patients full-time um, where I would only come in to take care of the patient for everything and then my preceptor would only come in to say hi do her own assessments and watch me pass meds but all the rest of the care would be done by me. And so I had one patient who was in isolation. So that means that he had to be in his own special room and that I had to dress up uh, with a, spe a specific mask and um, you know, to be able to take care of him because he was on airborne precautions. And the other two were very, um, demented patients so they didn't really know anything else besides just their name and they would constantly crawl out of bed and you know it was a huge deal for us because you never want to let any patients fall down it, to us in the hospital it's the beginning of the end to hospital administrators you don't get reimbursed for any care if a patient falls so um, well you don't get reimbursed for uh, taking care of the damages from the patient falling because they see that as your fault. So that's a huge deal in hospital administrators. And well, everything else still needs to be done. You still need to do your own assessment in the morning. You still need to be able to check and see what meds are needed. Um, a lot of my patients are on antibiotics and so I have to prep the uh, secondary bags. And then I also have to check to make sure that if the patient's getting uh, pretty heavy antibiotic like a vanc vancomycin then we have to check make sure that I, that my patient's not getting red and that he's not getting an, a reaction to the uh, antibiotic and then I also have to draw blood so that the doctors and the pharmacists can tell whether or not that antibiotic vancomycin is um, creating any damage to his kidneys apparently it was during that day because his creatinine had been high so we definitely need to get that vancomycin trough levels and so he, my one patient was on the other side of the ward and then my other two patients were on the complete other side. So I didn't have any help. I wasn't having a, a corpsman or like a CNA because the preceptor wanted me to be able to take care of patients on my own. And so... So with one patient on one side of the ward in isolation and the other two patients in extreme fall risks, I had a lot on my hands. And this is actually normal. This is what a lot of nurses do. They're always juggling things, patients, staff, doctors, timelines, deadlines, specimens, um, and barely, being, I mean, barely having any time to eat within the whole 12 hour period. So. I know that my complaints compared to most everyday nurses are nothing, but it still feels bad to me the same. I mean, as a nursing student, it, these things are huge, you know, you feel like everything's the end of the world. And I just want to make this video because <laughs> right now it felt like the end of the world. It feels like the end of the world. Anyway. so. 
<sighs> so one of my patients is on one side and the other two patients are on the other side. One's in isolation, the other two are high fall risks. And um, you know, the other two also have ostomy bags and neuro checks and the other one has multiple antibiotics you know, floating in that I'm um, infusing. And then the other two also have antibiotics that I'm infusing as well. And, you know, we can't restrain them. You can't, we don't have enough people to do a one-to-one -one on the other two who are high fall risks and are uh, demented. So I just had to rely on the bed alarm to tell me whenever an emergency would happen and I have to just run out of one room and just go into that other room. Well, something happened. I was inside the um, the negative air pressure room and I was, I had finished hanging my antibiotic and I was just starting to put up my, my saline flush. Uh, well, it was just, uh, I put the rate in, uh, to be high and then my volume to be infused would be, um, just a modicum amount, just enough saline to clean out the tubing. So to make sure that the patient gets a whole antibiotic. And while I was doing that, uh, one of my other patients all the way across the hall had begun to get up out of bed. And then when she did, other people tried to help her, but then she went into some kind of whatever state where she just threw her head back. And then, you know, she almost fell, but she landed on the bed. And then when they tried to assess her, her pupils were pinpointed, her blood pressure was low. Um, you know, we call the stroke code. So I went to go try to help. And I thought that I had programmed the infusion bag to be exactly what I had wanted it to be, just 25 mils. But in actuality, I had uh, programmed a high rate and a high amount of volume. And then I had pressed start. So when I got when I had gotten out of the other patient's room and then went back to the negative air pressure room, I tried to gather my thoughts to see where I had to go back to where I was uh, as far as nursing activities and tasks were. Um, and I saw that I had flushed about like 200 cc's, which is roughly about a cup into my patient. And it was just water, but you know, it could have been worse because when nurses are giving medications and you do it through the IV, there's no going back. It just goes straight to the heart and to the body and the rest of the cardiovascular system. And, and once it's in there, it's, it's in there. And um, if this was some other uh, medication like uh, corrosive medications or something that was very terrible, you know, a patient could have lost his life or a limb or, you know, just it could harm the patient and not just limbs and not just a patient's life, but then the family members would be devastated. You know, uh, the doctors can order the medications, the pharmacist can make and mix the medications, but it's really the nurse who's the last line of resort. And if I don't have all my ducks in a row, then what good am I? Well, luckily my preceptor had talked to me about it and we talked to the doctor and we didn't really need to do any interventions. Um, the patient was fine. He wasn't on any fluid overload whatsoever, but it was still embarrassing. You know, it was still a, a mistake that I had to cop out to, to my preceptor and then to the doctor. Um, but funnily enough, my preceptor decided that she would demote me back to two patients, but it wasn't because of that incident about the bolus. It was more about the fact that my charting wasn't up to her standards. And she has very high standards. And she says that, and all the other staff says that. She said that, you know, some of the other staff say that if I had gone with another nurse preceptor, I would have probably had an easier time. Um, things would have been more mellow. But the preceptor that I'm with is very thorough. You know, she's very analytical and everything's very to the point and that things have to be done a certain way. So I can say and chart the right things, but if it's not in the right order, it's not correct to her. So I, I do my best to try to be able to do that. And during the past, you know, three to four weeks, 
I've been getting there. I've only had to have a couple of my notes uh, re-edited or edited by my preceptor. But, you know, she wants everything to be perfect. And not every patient is the same, so it's hard for me to understand exactly what's right and what's wrong because things are constantly changing. I don't have a, a precedent for me to follow. And it's very confusing to me. So, you know, what, what I think is important for, for her one day is, becomes different and changes the next day. Like, for example, I, I thought our vital signs and flow sheets, eyes and nose treatments and invasive line charting was more important than anything else because those had to be done at the top of the hour uh, continuously. And so when I was starting to fall behind, I wanted to catch up. And you can't go too far ahead because, you know, your charting can't be done ahead of time. So I have to be within 15 minutes of the top of the hour. And once I start getting there, I need to start going to the next patient and the next patient. And I don't get to talk to the patients the way I want to. Um, so I just have to, like, laugh at the jokes and say, hey, ha, 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 and just listen to what they're saying, but then slowly start stepping out of the room because I need to go take care of my other patient. And I hate to do that to them, but... I have too many patients, so I can't make every single patient feel personable, but I do have to treat my patients with a minimum, hey, with, with a high quality of care, but equal in all places for all patients. Does that make sense? I don't know. Basically, you can have basic minimal nursing here, but... And you can have the best you know, nursing care for an individual patient up here, but it would, what I'm aiming for is to be closer up here, but with all my patients and not just one patient that I like. Every single patient that I'm taking care of, whether or not I like them or not, as a person, means nothing. I'm their nurse and they're under my care and everybody will get full quality of care. And that's what I'm reaching for. And this is why I'm very grateful to my preceptor. She never gives me a compliment. And that's hard. It's hard on me because I never know if I'm doing any good. Um, I just have to rely on gossip and I have to rely on her facial expressions. And it's tough. It's tough to, to rate that because to me that's important. Her opinion is important. And I want to feel like I'm doing good. But I don't always feel like that. But maybe that's, that's what nursing is, is that you're not always going to have control or you're not always going to know what's, what's happening and you're going to feel helpless. And today, I felt especially helpless today. <laughs> um, my, continuing on with the story, um, once I fixed and uh, we fixed a flush on the one other patient in the negative pressure room, the other two patients had bowel emergencies and one had gotten up because somebody had tried to help her go to the bathroom but forgot to turn the alarm back on. So I didn't know when the patient had left the bed. And when I went to go check up on her on my hourly checks, I saw that the bag was still running antibiotics. I looked down onto the floor where the tube was. It was not in her arm and the catheter was on the floor. And I go into the bathroom and Oh my gosh, she was bleeding everywhere. Luckily, she didn't fall, but she was in the toilet and she was just looking at her arm, just talking nonsensically. And, um, you know, I had to press on it, put her back together, clean her up, get her to the bed right away, stop the infusion, um, dress her old site and find a new site. And man, finding an IV on older people greater than 80 years old is tough. All my experience of giving IVs to um, in the military was always with the younger patients with healthy veins and big arms and you know trying to do that with a small frail little old lady her, which skin is is thinner than paper is not easy and again these are normal things that normal nurses do but I have a lot of respect now for the profession it's not a, it's not really that easy. I mean, you can come in, prescribe something, talk to the patient once or twice, and then leave. But nurses are the ones that are stuck with 
trying to enforce all the orders and taking all the specimens and harm, you know, making it look like you're harming the patient when in fact you're doing good, you know, and you're just doing something that you're ordered to do. But you have to take out the specimen. You have to poke them. You have to get them to drink gallons of go lightly, which is like, um, like a, a laxative and to clean out the bowels and you just have to sit there and watch them do it and see how much they eat and how much they drink. It's fun. It really is fun. But it's hard when you're dealing with gossip and you're trying to take care of patients that don't appreciate you or doctors that are demanding, and, you know, and you can't expl you try to explain to them how the patient really is, but they believe wholeheartedly that the patient is one way because they only see the patients partially partially so you know doctors that don't listen are very hard to work with um, and just generally just uh, you know not getting the timing right and I'm going to get the timing right eventually but I did feel like I was also being like bullied and I had to it's very hard when you're dealing with nurse bullies uh, because I adore my preceptor and I respect her, but I felt like she was talking about me because every time I go to the nursing station, she would hush and then her corpsman would hush and it was like nobody could make eye contact with me. And, and it felt like it was so real, you know? And then other staff members were saying, hey, why are you letting her talk to you like that? And you know, you can just ignore her. She's really mean to you. And I just say, you know, I, I really need her help. I need her to teach me how it is. And I need to be able to be a good nurse. When I'm a nurse, I want to be as competent and as thorough as her, but maybe just a little bit nicer. You know, put my own spin as, a, as my own nurse. But for now, I have to work under her and I have to learn everything that she learns. And... I have to put up with it, you know, I have to put up with her personality. It's not necessarily bad and it's not necessarily good. It's just her personality, just like my personality is my own. So, but when does it stop? When does it become too much? So, I don't mind being yelled at and I don't mind when... Um, People laugh at me, but I do mind when people are talking behind my back. And it puts you in a weird place. I don't know how girls do it, but it happens a lot in nursing school, and it happens while you're a nurse, and it'll probably happen all the time. So nurse bullying is a popular topic among nurses because it's hard to differentiate, at least for me, whether or not they're just giving you tough love or they're just being cruel. And so I called my preceptor and I said, hey, I think I'm having a little problem communicating with my preceptor. Can I have your blessing to, to confront her, to talk to her? And my professor was like, absolutely. And then I asked her, I said, if things go south, you know, if I mess up this discussion, I, you know, I do want to talk to my, my, you know, my preceptor first before I go anywhere else because I, w I want to do a one-on-one -on -one with her, but that's the hardest part. And my professor says, yes, yes, it is the hardest part, but you do have to do it if you feel like that's what you need to do. And I said, well, professor, if, can I get your blessing that if things go south, can I just go with a backup preceptor and go with another preceptor? And she says, no, <laughs> on the phone. While I was eating my lunch alone. <laughs> well, not alone. I, I was talking with some of the Dunkin' Donut ladies. They were very nice to me. They liked me. Anyway, so I said, okay, I'll talk to her. And I went back upstairs and I started the rest of the shift. There was about three hours left to go out of the 12 hour shift. And I said, hey, um, can I talk to you? I know you're busy, but maybe we can do it after handoff report just for a few minutes. I just want to talk to you about my performance. And she goes, yeah, sure. What do you want to talk about? And I said, well, I just, 
my professor and I would just like to have like more of a conversation rather than just signing papers on an eval about my performance and how I can do better. And she said, okay, fine. So we had a little bit of a lull, probably about 10, 15 minutes right before handoff to the oncoming shift. And she, I, before I could even ask her to do it in a private room, she was like, okay, let's do it here in the nursing station right now. I said, okay. And she said, what's the problem? And I said, well, I feel like during the mornings from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, that I have a hard time keeping up with a pace. And a lot of that has to do with not just charting, but knowing exactly what you want me to do next or what you want me to do first and then what you want me to do right away and what you want me to drop and what you want me to do. For example, when you told me to do a blood draw, you had taught me that the flow sheets was most important because it was on the hour. But then you come in and you say, hey, I need you to do this draw, blood draw, and I told you five minutes ago and you need to go do it now. And I said, okay, well, all right. I was in the middle of a, you know, assessing and doing the vitals on a patient, but I stopped that and then went to go take care of